All right, Lauren, what's up? Another thing that. Hey, okay, hey how are you? Um, Good. So I've watched you on and off for a little bit. And um, so when you were talking about the New Testament, you're talking about it was like written in Greek and all of this. Well, uh -huh. Jesus was there for Jews and Gentiles. And a lot of the. No, Gentiles he wasn't. Were no, he wasn't. Yes, he was. No. Yes, he was. Jesus said, no. Jesus said he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He told his apostles, when you go out, do not go to the Gentiles and do not go to the Samaritans. Only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus never said that he, that he had a message for the Gentiles. In fact, when there was a Canaanite woman who asked Jesus for help, he called her a dog and he says, should I take crumbs from the children's table and feed it to the dogs? No, he says, should I take bread? from the children's table and feed it to the dogs. So Jesus did not have a message for Gentiles. He just did. so you know, Lauren. He, he did have a message. Lauren, for you yes. are absolutely 100% wrong. The Bible never says that. It expressly says that he only had a message for the Jews. So listen, you are 100% wrong. Jesus did not have a message for the Gentiles. So. Whoever told you that lied to you. And if you go look, study the Bible, you will find out that I am right. And whoever told you that I is wrong. I have studied the Bible. And you I have not, Lauren. It. I that can promise you I have. I yeah. promise you, you have not. Because you don't know that Jesus was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he expressly yeah. said, do not go to the Gentiles. I didn't realize that for years either until I actually studied it. Where are you talking about the lost sheet of the whatever you just said? I think it. I think Matthew chapter ten is where it says it. So let me go hunt my Bible up. I'll see if I can find it for you. But he says it in more than one place. But I think Matthew ten is one of them. <clears throat> Let's see. There it is, uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you shall give. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, Jesus expressly says, do not go to the Gentiles. Now, you find a verse where Jesus said, go to the Gentiles. Now, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a cheat code. Matthew 28, 19, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, and he, he that believes and baptized will be saved. Matthew 28, 19. This was after Jesus resurrected from the dead and, and the instant before he was whisked away into heaven. But Jesus himself, while he was on earth, said, do not go to the Gentiles. It's only when he ascended into heaven, he told his apostles that they should go to the Gentiles. But while he was on earth, he said to his apostles, do not even talk to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Gentiles. So in Romans 1 16, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Right. Who's speaking in Romans chapter one? That's not Jesus. It's, it, <laughs> it is Paul. Right. Paul taught the opposite of Jesus all the time. No. He Jesus didn't. said that you had to obey the law. Paul said you don't have to obey the law. Paul taught the opposite of Jesus. Jesus said go only to the Jews. Paul said I'm to, I'm for the, the apostle for the Gentiles. So Paul is not Jesus. And Paul taught the opposite of Jesus. But what you and I were talking about is what did Jesus say? And I showed you in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, that Jesus said, do not go to the Gentiles. But Christians today want to follow Paul and not Jesus. Well, Paul was inspired by Jesus. I mean, he is Paul instead of Saul because of Jesus. Well, I, what if anybody can say I'm inspired? I could say that too. 
I'm inspired by Jesus, you know, or I could say I'm inspired by the one true God and he, and he's not the God of the Bible, but, but the true God is the one who inspired me. And he told me that this Bible was from a false God. And so are you going to believe me just because I say so? Because that's all Paul has. He never met Jesus face to face. He did meet Jesus face to face. No, he, <laughs> no, did he didn't. The resurrected Jesus, he sure did. No, he saw a light. That was it. And, and then he was blinded. So he was blinded by the light. And so in this story is, is in the book of Acts, and it's not even Paul's account of his own uh, conversion. Paul did not write Acts. Somebody mm -hmm. else wrote it. Yeah, Luke did. Well... That's the that's the claim, but there's no evidence for that. There's no evidence that Luke wrote Luke. You know, Luke never says, my name is Luke and I'm writing this stuff. They attributed names to these because they were anonymous. And in the late second century, they said, we've got to start attaching names to these things or people are going to realize that uh, that we don't know who wrote it, or at least we're not attaching names to these authors. We we believed all that stuff for over 30, 40 years, Lauren. Trust me. Until what we made dug into the truth? What made y'all completely just go against God? Reading the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that that'll do it. If you just if you read the Bible with honesty and sincerity, uh, and when Jesus makes promises in the Bible but he does not keep them, that demonstrates that he's a liar. And why would you keep worshiping someone when you know that he's a liar? What promises has he not kept? Well, he, he said that he was going to return before his apostles died. Do you when think Jesus already that? returned in the glory of his father with the mighty when angels? To Where does he say he's going to return before the apostles die? Matthew 16, 28. And Matthew 10, 23. Yeah, Matthew 23, 24, 30, like several times. He says it in Mark 9, 1, I think. So. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That's Matthew 10, 23. So, so what do you yeah. think that means? When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Yeah, he told them to hurry up. When he, when he sent them to Israel, he says, this is why he told them not to go to the Gentiles, because he had a message for the Jews and the Jews only, and he was going to come back so quickly that they needed to hurry from town to town because they were not even going to have time to make it to every town of Israel before he returned in the glory of his Father with his mighty angels to judge the world. That's Matthew 16, 27 and 28. So that's what we're saying. The more you read the Bible, the more you see. And I feel like you're pulling it out of context. Like you're not reading the whole chapter. You're just pulling Lauren, it out of one verse. Lauren. It's not. Trust, trust us, it's not. I've, I've read the entire thing front to back a thousand times. I've studied it more than anybody you've ever met, most likely. I, I believed in it for 46 years. But I got honest. That's the only difference. That when, in, in fact, I remember reading Matthew 16, 28 when I was like 19 years old. I was a Christian. I was teaching Bible class in church. And I got flushed. Like, I actually fainted. The only time I have ever lost consciousness my whole life. Well, I mean, I, I've had anesthesia for surgery and stuff. But I mean, the only time I lost consciousness, not giving medicine, uh, was when I read Matthew 16, 28, when I was about 19 years old, teaching Bible class in church, and I was teaching these high school students. I was in college teaching high school students, and I came across this verse, and, and I immediately knew what it meant. I was like, oh my goodness, Jesus said he was going to come before they died, and I didn't understand what does this mean? And so, 
I left Bible class and we went out into the assembly to sing and worship. And when 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 they said let's stand for the first song, uh, when I stood up, I guess I lost lost blood to my brain or whatever. I lost consciousness, passed out in church, knocked a woman over in front of me, and uh, you know I had to go to the doctor and get checked out. They thought something was wrong with me, and I said no, I was just stressed out because I read Matthew sixteen twenty eight. I lost consciousness because of, I fainted because of it. <laughs> And there was nothing wrong with me. I went to the doctor. All my vitals were good. Blood pressure was good. Everything's good. Blood sugar, everything good. Oh. That's what and, the and, truth and, does to you. <laughs> and it took me 20 or twenty years or more to actually realize that Jesus consistently, uh, and I, I write about it in this book, that Jesus consistently, every single time he ever talked about his return, he told his apostles that they were going to see it in matthew chapter 24 when he says you see this temple it's going to be destroyed they said what are the signs of your coming and the end of the age when is this going to happen when is the temple going to be destroyed because that is the end of the age and the the, the his the sign of his coming and he's he goes on to say then after he talks about some signs of earthquakes and uh, blood moons and stuff like that he says, then you will see the sign of the Son of Man in the clouds with his angels. And a couple verses later, Jesus said in verse 30, he said, assuredly, I say to you, all these things will take place before this generation passes away. And he says, when you see the signs, flee Judea to the mountains. So it was only about Judea again. It was not about the world. It's not a worldwide destruction. All they had to do was flee Judea. Jesus was supposed to return before his apostles died. They were going to see it. They were going to see all the signs before they died. This is what the Bible teaches. I'm not they, twisting anything. I'm just reading what it says. They see him after the resurrection. They but that's, that, it's not that's, saying. He talked about that separately. He says, you know, he said that he was going to come out of the tomb in three days. But when he said he was going to come in the clouds with the glory of his father, with his mighty angels to judge everyone according to their works, that's the second coming. And he said that was going to happen in their sight before they died in their generation. And, it, and he tied it to the destruction of the temple. He said it's going to happen when the temple is destroyed, which happened in 70 CE. It also says we don't know the time, not even only the they, father. Knows. They didn't know the time or the hour. They didn't know the time or the hour. Right, and so, so, right, so it's not saying that we don't know the time today because it's not written to us. It's two thousand years old, written in a different language in a different culture. But what what it was saying to them is that they it would come on them like a thief in the night, not us. The Bible is not written to us. We're not the audience. They were the audience, and they were told that they didn't know when it was going to happen, so they needed to be ready, and and uh, that it was going to come on them like a thief in the night. And and it did, because in 70 CE, people thought everything was fine. They went to worship uh, on Passover, and then all of a sudden, boom, the Romans destroyed the city and the temple and, and the people. That's why the instructions was, when you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, flee to the mountains. That was the instruction. Right. The, That's Luke 21. The Bible, though, is, and I know you're not going to agree with this at all. You're going to dispute it, but it's living, and it is talking to us directly. Even though it's well, not cultural, it's not, I mean, it's, it was okay. in a different okay, so. Time. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Let's see how the Bible is applicable. In fact, let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you think the Bible is living and it's always applicable, let's just turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And, and, and in no way am I... I don't believe what the Bible says. I'll, let, before I do this, let me cycle. I see I'm frozen, so I don't want to get shut down in the middle of it. I'll be back in 10 seconds. This is going to be good.
with. All right, that one took longer than 10 seconds. Let me fix my background. What's going on here? I've got an unstable network. Can y'all hear me? I don't me? know why you keep freezing. I don't know. Thank you for my gift, you guys. All right, are you there, uh, Lauren? I am. All right, so First Timothy chapter two. Uh, we're we're talking about whether or not the Bible is the living word of God, that it's always applicable, and that it actually changes throughout time to make sure that it's always applicable or something. Oh, uh, so First Timothy chapter two, verse eleven. It says, "A woman should learn in quietness and full submission." I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one who was deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Do you have children, Lauren? I do have children. All right. Well, that, that's all you need. As long as you have children, you're saved. And... and you got to be quiet too. You got to, you can't speak uh, and you got to, you got to be in full mm -hmm. submission. Right. So yeah, if you ever wear, yeah, if you braid your hair, you got to quit because it says you can't, you can't wear jewelry. You can't wear nice clothes either. Oh, where is that one? Oh, that's a good one to read too. That's not in first Timothy two. That's somewhere else. So do you, do you think um, that the Bible is living, Lauren? Is that still applicable? I do. I do think that the Bible is living, but I also First think Peter. that Paul was First also Peter, talking. Peter do what? I'm sorry. Well, I was giving the scripture. First Peter 3.3. 3. All right. Let's read First Peter 3.3 3 real fast. Let's see. Uh, First Peter 3.3. 3. Well, let's start with verse 1 because that's not far from 3. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. I hope you submit to your husband. If any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles or the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be the your inner self, the unfading beauty of gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. So your okay. husband is your Lord. So, uh, let you me can't wear nice clothes. Can I, can I speak on this one? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so... This picture right here that Paul is creating, I mean, Peter is creating, is talking about the family as, yes, a husband should be the head of the household. The husband should be the Christ follower. The husband should be the one that is, he, I mean, he should take care of the household because that's what a man is to do. The husband is to be the leader of the household, the spiritual leader, the physical leader of the household. The breadwinner. But we just so, read where it says let that. Let me finish. Let me finish, please. Well, but you're so, saying something that that goes against what I just read. I'm not through. So yes, if my husband is praying to God and my husband is submissive to God, then I and my husband work together, and he's not going to be like a master over me, like it says. He's not going to be my telling me to go bow down to him and do exactly what he says. We're going to work together as a team, even though the, the, the Bible, I just got through reading where it says wives submit to your husbands, even if they don't believe. So you don't, you're, you're saying, well, if my husband does what is right, and good, then he's going to believe and we're going to work together as a team. That is not what the Bible says. So when you say the Bible is living, what you mean is I can interpret it any way I want to no, and whatever no. fits me today, then I'll say that's what the Bible says. Even though when you go read it, it says something different. I tell you it means something different. 
I'm not saying that I no, I don't believe that at well, all. Well, you're changing it. So I, I'm not you're the one that's changing it. it. I'm not changing it. Yes, you I'm are. Just saying that it's written. I mean, this is. You do understand when this was written, women didn't have rights at that time. They were lower in status. Yeah. So do you wear a, exactly, exactly and so I, Lauren, do you wear, every time you pray, do you put something over your head? I don't. What, do you know the it Bible says that say, you have to? It doesn't say you cannot wear these things. It says it you should not come from, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided right, hair. Which, which means you need to, you mean to, it means you do not need to wear fine clothes. You do not it's need saying, to wear it fancy hair you don't have to oh my goodness your so you're changing beauty. it your Lauren, inner you're... beauty it, i'm reading it you, no you're not your beauty no, should no, not you're come not. from outward right. adornment right it's so that means braided hair the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes Instead, that means you cannot wear gold jewelry that's what that means not say it says your beauty should <sighs> not come from outward adornment it is not saying not to God. wear it it's saying that instead I should look inside of somebody's heart. That's where right. their beauty comes Don't from. That means, so outside. you shouldn't dress nice because that would distract men to think about your physical beauty. You're supposed to have plain hair, no jewelry, and no fine clothes so that you can demonstrate your true beauty comes from the inside, not from the outside. If you wear nice clothes and glue jewelry, you are violating the Bible. That I is, don't believe that at that all. That is what was meant. Right, because you don't believe the Bible, Lauren. How do, you know, how do you know that was what it was meant? You're just interpreting it as you want to interpret it. I'm not it interpreting it at all. It says, let not your beauty come from braided hair, gold jewelry, or fine clothes, but let your beauty come from the inside. Yeah, so, it's like judging a book by the cover. You don't judge a book by the cover. That's it's not exactly what that what means, it's Lauren. It does it's not saying, say. It's yes. saying, do not. Okay, Lauren, you just travel listen. Travel back in time. If you travel back in time and walk around the street where these women were, you will see they did not braid their hair. They did not adorn themselves outwardly. You will see this is the case. So, so let's turn to First Corinthians chapter eleven. If you think the Bible is still applicable today, uh, let's bring Precious up. Uh, Precious, accept. Uh, for now in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, it says, Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. If Because it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off. So do you think it's disgraceful if a woman doesn't have hair? Because the Bible says it is. So no, I don't, because if a woman happen. cuts her hair too short, it's a disgrace. Then you don't believe the Bible, Lauren, because the Bible says it is. Can so, I also um, say something? Uh, Jeff, you just read something from 1 Timothy 2. Uh, when you actually go to verse 14, it says, And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who was deceived and fell into transgression. So the entire blame is kept upon Eve. And then when it says that a woman will be saved through childbearing, this childbearing is a form of punishment because she was the one. So, you know, Adam and Eve were both responsible, but we can see here that the entire responsibility and the blame is on Eve, on the woman. Yeah. I don't think yeah. this, this book glorifies women or respects women. Well, and listen, listen to this. Childbearing is a form of punishment. Right. So let, let's let's get yeah. back in First Corinthians eleven because this is some good stuff. Uh, verse seven says. So we just got through saying it's a dishonor if a woman cuts her hair off. Uh, verse seven says a man ought not to cover his head. See, I don't cover my head, and so I'm good. See, God likes me because I have no hair. But you uh, don't believe in him. You're holy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but at least he loves me though. So. So since he is the image, you see, I am the image of God, me. You're not because you're a woman. You're, the, you're just listen to this. So uh, a man should not cover his head because the man is the image of God. But woman is the glory of man. You see, 
woman was taken out of man. So listen, this next verse is really good. Uh, For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. So saying that Eve was formed out of Adam's rib. So women wouldn't exist if it wasn't for men. And women were created. Here's the, here's the point. Neither was man created for woman, but woman was created for man. You see, women, the sole purpose for women's existence is to satisfy men. That is, that, that's so, why God created women. And Genesis. Which verse is that, Jeff? In Genesis, it talks about he needed a helper. And that is why he cre- God created right. a woman. Right. He needed a woman to help him because none of the animals were suitable for his needs. So he needed a woman that would be suitable for his needs. So God made a woman for the sole purpose of satisfying Adam's needs. So that's why a woman is supposed to submit to man because you're not the image of God. You're the image of man. You were created for man. This is why you submit to man. This is why you're not allowed to think. It's why you're not allowed to speak. You're just told to obey your husband and uh yeah because these stories were written back in a time and in a culture where women were low in status that's why it talks about this like women in there like that and that's what you need to realize Lauren. it is not written for us today the authors wrote these stories for a specific people in a specific time in a specific culture for a specific reason. So precious, that is first Corinthians chapter 11, verse nine. It says, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So women were created for men. This is why women are to submit to men. And this is why women are not allowed to pray without their head covered, because you're supposed to recognize that you're not the image of God. You're not the glory of God. You're the glory of man. This image, this covering over your head is, is a representation to all people who see you, that you recognize that you are a second class citizen, that you are not the child of God, but you're just a, an object created to satisfy Jeff man. Jeff doesn't believe this, by the way, you all. He's just Correct. stating what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says, right. Yeah, thank you for the confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> I do think uh I, I, I do think women uh well never mind. I, I can't go down that don't road. Run no, no, it. don't, don't, don't. Save your butt. do not run it. <laughs> yeah. By the way, uh Jeff, I wanna say something regarding this Adam and Eve thing. Um you know, in one of the Jewish commentaries, okay, this is actually a very real thing. In one of the Jewish commentaries, it says that naming the animals okay because in genesis it says that adam was naming the animals and then women was created for him in one of the commentaries it says that naming the animals is a euphemism for having sexual intercourse with every animal so in 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 one of the jewish commentaries it says that adam had sexual intercourse with every animal in the garden but then he did not find any of them suitable, and that's why women was created for him. That was also interesting. In a yeah. Jewish did you know about that, Jeff? Wow. Um, I didn't know. I, I'm, I'm still a little bit shocked that a Jewish commentary would say that. Uh, I, that's shocking to me that a Jewish commentary would say that. Me too. So, Lauren, uh, do you see that the Bible is not up with the times, that it's not changing to keep up with the times? You know, I could go read First Peter 2.18 that talks about how slaves are supposed to obey their masters even when they beat them unjustly. Do you think it's okay to beat your slaves unjustly today? No, I don't. But I do believe that, I believe that the Bible speaks to you when you are reading it. And I believe that God does speak to you. I used to believe I used to believe I mean, do you not, you never really felt that it did speak to you and it was telling you and getting you through a hard time? Oh, yeah, I thought it did, yeah. But so, so when I would go through hard times, I remember thinking I was Job at one point in life, thinking that God was, you know, treating me (laughs) like he treated Job. Right. Uh, And so, so I was like, well, 
you know, if they persecuted Jesus, they persecuted Job, I guess we're just supposed to have miserable lives and this is all good because the Bible says so. Yeah, I thought I was being put through the fire. But everybody's put through the fire because life is hard and uh, it's not because, because, you know, the fact that we endure hardship uh, and, and the God of the Bible just says, well, hey, I, I can't help you out. You know, we all go through hard times, you know, they persecuted Jesus, so they're going to persecute you too. So, he, but in other places, he says, uh, whoever asks, receives, whoever knocks, the door will be opened and whoever believes in me can ask for anything in my name and receive it. So the father will be glorified through the son. Well, I tried that a million times and it never worked. And so the only ones that work are the ones that say, God just wants you to suffer and you need to deal with it. You know, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Well, hallelujah, I, I lost my job. Uh, hallelujah, I've gone into debt. Praise the Lord. He hasn't helped me and he's not going to help me, but I'm still supposed to praise the Lord anyway because he doesn't do anything. So Even Lord, when you're Lord. persecuted, like they, they want you to think that, you know, uh, you're being persecuted because it's something that the Lord wants. Right. So if a Christian is being persecuted, they're going to be like, hallelujah. It's a good thing. happy about right. it. Yeah. The, the so fact Lord, that you're the, the fact that we're telling you, Lauren, that the Bible is not true means that you're true because the Bible says they're going to persecute you. You know, Jesus said the whole world will hate you because of me. Yes. Well, one of the that, main things that doesn't require do. any power, you know, what would what would demonstrate a true God would be somebody that could actually demonstrate supernatural powers and not just say, well, you're going to suffer and I'm not going to help you and uh, and everybody's going to hate you. One of the Petrina, main things you were that saying caused something. me to start questioning. Yeah, one of the main things that had me start questioning was I remember reading in the Bible and I thought the way you did, Lauren, that it was the holy word of God and it was the truth. And everything that's in there is fact. But I remember reading about communion. Anybody that takes communion unworthy will get sick or die if they take it unworthy. And the last time I took communion, I was with a drug addict that I brought him to church trying to get him saved. He took communion and I didn't have a chance to stop him. And I thought, oh no, he's going to get sick or die. Nothing happened to him. And I thought, well... I thought he was supposed to get sick or die. I've never, now that I think about it, I've never seen anybody get sick or die if they took communion unworthily. So was that even true? And when I started questioning that, I started questioning all the other things that I was seeing not coming to pass. Why does it was say that? that? And it's yeah. not necessarily a physical sickness. I mean, it could be a spiritual sickness. No, well, that's it, not it, what it's talking about. Well, it's so Petrina, I think you're remembering. You, you, I, here's the verse that talks about that, and it doesn't it doesn't say that specifically. It's also in First Corinthians 11. So the same chapter that talks about women having to cover their heads because they were made for man, they're the glory of man, not the glory of God. Uh, the same chapter talks about the Lord's Supper, and in First Corinthians 11, verse 27, it says, "So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord." in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's why many among you are weak. Well, so you can imply this. So verse 30 says, that is why many uh, uh, among you are weak and sick and number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were... Right more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, we were, uh, we are See? judged in this way by the Lord. So it says this is the reason why many of you are weak or sick. Uh, and right. some of you have even fallen asleep. So Die, I, yeah. I never drew that conclusion. I, I mean, uh, but I see how I you did. draw the conclusion. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, did you know that even in the previous cultures, uh, the idea of communion, like in previous religions prior to Christianity, it was also a thing. Like, for example, in, in Zoroastrianism, uh, they also have the communion kind of uh, thing, and they also have it in like other religions like Myth Mithraism. Mithraism. Yeah. 
No, even even in Zoroastrianism, uh, the drink itself is known as Heyoma, I think. Yeah. So it's not only Christianity uh, in which communion is actually there. The communion, there also, it's, yeah. I mean, it's the remembrance of what, I mean, it's remembering what Christ did for us. The You know, the bread is the body, the wine but is Jesus the didn't blood. you to do it. He instructed his disciples only. Well, we don't have to do it. It's just a remembrance thing. It's not something that we have to do. If we never take communion, we're not going to hell. Well, but Lauren, you were the one making the claim that the Bible is the living word and it's just as applicable today as it ever was. I believe that. But, but so, Lauren, that's not what I was saying, though. I was just saying that it was also like present in other religions prior to okay. Christianity. So but it was not in Judaism. Society. It, no, so, it's not in Judaism. Yeah. So exactly. these traditions, these Christian traditions, the baptism in water as an initiation into the club and uh, the eating flesh and drinking blood. These are pagan practices that were in pagan religions, not in Judaism. But there is no baptism for the saying, remission of sins. He's huh? not saying, I mean, cut me up and eat my skin. He's not saying. Yeah, he actually did. No, he isn't. He's saying okay. my, the bread is my body. Remember it, that when you take this, what I did for you, the juice, the wine is the blood. Remember what I have done for you. He's doing this right before he's crucified. And they didn't know what was coming, but we do know that that is what was done. And that is something that we do on a routine basis to remember what he has done for us. But have you ever seen anybody do it unworthily and get sick? No, I haven't. <laughs> but like I said, I mean, I feel like that could be a spiritual sickness also. No, so. you're, you're adding into that. It that literally says getting weak and sick and falling asleep. So you're just, you're, you're, adding that it's not spiritual it's physical and that's 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 what a lot of christians do they want to uh substitute it for a spiritual thing when it's supposed to be physical so let me read to you what jesus said in john chapter six i found what i was looking for so john chapter six Oh, uh, let me find where to start. Welcome to John chapter six. I can I can read it for you. What, yeah. Where do you want well, me to I've, read? I've got it right here. So in verse 48, I think it's a good place to start. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Not die. If you eat this bread, you're not going to die. Eternal. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. So I know you have to change it to uh, spiritual living forever because everybody who's ever believed in Jesus died. But Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will never die. And so you have to say, well, that means your spirit lives on after your body dies because everybody knows that everybody dies. So you got to make excuses to make his promises come true. And there's no, there's no proof that anybody lives on in the spirit. It's, this is the promise that has no proof, but let's keep reading. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him in the last day for my flesh is real food. And my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. 
This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So he says his food, his flesh is food indeed. And this you got to eat his. This is spiritual. He so, is not. Yeah. So what? And Jeff, uh, I think the, the audience that he was talking to, I think they actually got disgusted and left. Is that also part uh -huh. of the story? Uh, well, let's see. The ver next verse is, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father enables him. Yeah, it says right there. Oh. He says it. Right. So, why, right. so why why were they offended? That's, that's the question. Why did they have to be offended like that? They. Well, but let me read one more verse. Let me read one more verse. We'll talk about it. From the time From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Oh. Uh, and so, so yeah, so people left him as a result of this teaching. I don't remember that part. That's interesting. And it's so, yes, when go you ahead, find Accolade. Out that Hannibalism uh, and uh, bestiality comes from I think, the I Jewish religion. I think these religion. words, uh, uh, Accolade, I think these words are a little bit uh, sensitive. Nah, don't use. No, those are, those are term correct. No, no, it does, it does, it does. I'm telling you, it does. Yeah, you better listen, about. accolade. But I won't repeat them again. Precious. Yeah, I won't repeat them again. But those are term relevant. <laughs> but yeah, that's where it comes she'll from. It comes you. from the Jewish, the Jewish religion. So don't be messing with Precious. She'll boot you. Um, Precious is respected here. <laughs> and um, when I started deconstructing for my faith, there was a lot of things in the Bible I learned that was disgusting and gross that was allowed and I couldn't believe it. And so Lauren, let me, let me say, so uh, at least the text does make some mention of the spirit there. So it says these words, where was it? It's verse uh, 63 says, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet some of them, some of you do not believe. So, uh, if he's talking about spiritually eating his flesh, he sure did a bad job of teaching it. Hey. And, and they yeah. asked, they asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And they said, you know, Jesus was speaking hard things, hard to understand. And they said, why do you do this, Jesus? And Jesus's answer was because I deliberately want to confuse people. That's what he said. Please tell me that scripture. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, Precious, you may have to help, help me find yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. he says, why do you speak in parables? And he says, here's what he actually says. He says, because to you, it has been given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. So he says, I want you to understand, but I do not want them to understand. This is why he spoke in parables. He says, they have eyes, but he says, this is to fulfill the scripture that says, Seeing they will not see and hearing they will not hear. So Jesus says, I deliberately speak in secret code language so Matthew that. 13? What, Matthew 13? I, I got it. I got it. 13? I got it. Yeah. 10 through 12. Katrina, I got it. Okay. It says it's in Matthew 10. Uh, no, it's in Matthew 13, verse 10. It says, uh, then the disciples came to Jesus and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. This is why I speak to them in parables, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. Yeah. So, so he specifically says the reason he speaks in parables is because he does not want other people to understand. 
He was not coming to you're actually teach. You're not finishing the, the, the scripture there. Go on down to 16. It says, but blessed are your eyes because you see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it or hear it. Did not hear whatever. And but to hear what you he's talking. He's talking not. to his favorite people there. So he's saying, he's talking to I, I, no, he's saying for well, you, see, I seven. want you to understand. But for them, I do not want them to understand. But blessed are your eyes because I have opened your eyes and I'm telling you, I'm speaking plainly to you. I'm explaining what I mean to you. But when I talk to those guys, I don't want them to understand. So I speak I in secret relevant. code language so that they can be confused because I do not want to forgive them. We have to remember audience relevance, Lauren, when you read it. And, because, and also, Petrina, the thing about the other prophets was that they did not speak in parables as much as he does. And this is why they went and they asked him, like, why do you always speak in parables? Because the other prophets, they used to speak more clearly and plainly, right? Well, so, yeah. so nobody yeah. ever, nobody ever deliberately spoke in parables for the expressed purpose of causing confusion except Jesus. Jesus is the only one that said, I speak in secret code language for the express purpose of confusing people. But yet it says God is not a God of an author of confusion. confusion. Right. But yet Jesus says that's why he spoke in parables. And Jesus says he does not want to forgive them. So let's not overlook that part of the verse in verse 15. It says, for this people's heart has be become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and, and I would heal them. So he's saying that he deliberately wants to speak in code because he does not want to forgive them. That is not he's what like, he's saying. It, it, it absolutely he's, is. How do you figure that, that he says he does not want to forgive them? It's because their hearts are hardened and calloused. And I'm sorry, but that's your heart right now. And... But I mean, who's responsible for that heart, though? Isn't it God that hardens the hearts? Well, so so read verse 11. So we're, we're backing up in the same context in verse 11. This is where the it disciples the came. Do you want me to the read disciples, The disciples yeah. came to him and asked, Why do you speak in parables? Jesus said, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them so he's saying god has revealed these secrets to a select few people and he he only wants you to know the truth he does not want them to know the truth so whoever and and then it says whoever has more will be given so you know uh what's that guy's name robin hood robin hood used to steal from the rich and give to the poor well jesus steals from the poor and gives to the rich he says take away even what the poor people have and give it to the rich people that's what jesus taught take from the poor and give to the rich oh that is true that is not completely go against that um the reason why he has to do that is because it guarantees the poor to go to heaven when they pass because no. they were poor being poor is equals being blessed no it's not that is not uh, yeah this is why the lady gave her last mite up so that, that she can be fully true. blessed. She gave more than the people that gave and physically more. Why do you think they are monks and the Christian poor. monks and, and nuns? That, blessed that are is, the poor. It does say blessed are the poor in spirit. No, well, Luke um, says blessed are the poor, that, not in spirit. Luke says blessed are the poor. Right. So we have a contradiction here. And also there is this instance where Jesus tells the, the rich man to sell everything he has and give it to yes. the poor so that well, he can enter the hey, kingdom of heaven. Hey, Precious or Petrina, if y'all can find this parallel context, let me see if it gives me a, a Which one? reference. Uh, this same story mean? about why he spoke in parables, if we look at what it says in, uh, you know what, I've got a reference. Maybe it's Luke 19.26. Let me see what Luke 19.26 says. Because... The other Gospels actually make it a little more clear than Matthew. What did mm, I say, okay, Luke 19, okay. 26? Try Mark 4, 12. Mark 4, 12. Let's see what that says. 
unraveling the yeah, gospel March, together. March 4. Uh, well, let's just see what Mark 4 says. So we'll read. This looks. Uh, and, we, and we have Luke 8. All right. So Mark 4, 10 says, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked about the parables. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. To, he's talking to the 12. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but not perceiving and ever hearing but not understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. This is the one I was thinking of because they say they are saying, why do you speak in parables? And he answers the same way and says, because you, it has been given to you to understand the mysteries, but it has not been given to them to understand the mysteries. And this is to fulfill prophecy that they will not see or perceive or understand or hear or turn and be forgiven. Oh, let me, and I see I'm frozen. So let yes. me, I'll be back in a second. The beautiful thing about that verse is that the writers of the book perceive, they know what that is, while the Gentiles that are reading the book doesn't know what that is. This is how you know that the Greeks cre wrote this, because this is the mythologies of the Greeks, and the Gentiles have no understanding of it. Yeah, these stories were never meant to be in our hands. Correct. Um, so, are we there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Jeff, I want to say something. Yeah. So when it says that it's a prophecy, so uh, it's a prophecy that people will be unbelievers. So is God planning that those people are unbelievers? Well, this is actually, uh, I've looked at this prophecy. Uh, and if we go to actually look at this prophecy or this it's not even a prophecy uh, it's not a I've, prophecy yeah I've, I've tracked it down before and it it doesn't it doesn't say in the old testament the way it spins it in the new testament anyway so this is the way the new testament writers always every time they quote the old testament they're misquoting it and changing the meaning of it and did every you time. know that they also added words they added words that when you go to Isaiah 6, I think, uh, you don't see it. They added some words to it. Right. That's not there, yeah. Right. So the Greeks it reinterpreted, and this is Accolade's favorite topic. So the Greeks uh, wrote the Old Testament. They're translated or wrote. He thinks they originally wrote it, but tradition says they translated it from Hebrew to Greek. Correct. Uh, but... When they, whenever they translated it or wrote it, it was definitely different. And Josephus says that they didn't even have the full uh, Hebrew scriptures in the Greek language in the first century common era. So he says he was going to work on this project and try to finish translating the new, the Old Testament into Greek. Uh, and funny how almost every time the New Testament quotes an Old Testament verse, they're always quoting the Greek Septuagint instead of the Hebrew scriptures because the people who wrote the New Testament were not Hebrews and didn't speak Hebrew. Thank you, Jeff. I really... So, Lauren, we've gone through a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we talked about how the Bible says that women are made for men. Uh, they're supposed to submit to men. We've talked about slavery, how God approves of uh, slaves being beaten by harsh slave owners uh, and we've talked about how jesus deliberately wants to confuse people uh, we talked about how women are not allowed to pray unless they've got their head covered and we talked about how jesus uh, said that you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood he says my flesh is food indeed and then you say well he's only talking about taking the lord's supper eating a cracker and a drinking grape juice but he deliberately spoke in a way so that he could confuse people. And this is not what a this is not what a good God would do. A good God is not going to come and cause confusion. And uh, a good God would want everybody to repent, right? Would want everybody 
to understand and say, I'm here to bring uh, a revelation of truth and goodness to the world. But Jesus didn't claim to do that. He claimed to take away from the poor and give it to the rich. Jesus, <laughs> maybe, no, he didn't take away from the poor to give to the rich. Not at all. We read and that verse. Reason, we just read it. The reason so, that he. You don't believe the Bible. Go back. Where was that verse? Uh, that one was in Matthew. What was that? Matthew 12 when we were reading the parable thing in Matthew. Oh, it was Matthew 13, I think. Let me see. I think that one was Matthew 13. Uh, verse 12, whoever has, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. So if you're rich, you get richer. And if you're poor, you get poorer, according to Jesus. Matthew 13, 12. Is that nice to Let's make see. the rich richer? And the poor, poor. This is talking about. Okay, so go back to when the you know the one of the parables where the farmer gives you know these the whatever the workers the however many yeah. coins T the, the ten the, talents you know, and the five talents and the one yeah. talent and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So talking about that, I mean the one that went and buried his but didn't earn interest, you know all of that. Like. Yeah. It's not necessarily talking about the talents. It's talking about what you do for the kingdom of heaven. It's what you do to further that, to let others know about God and what Christ has done for them. It is the more that you give into that, yes, you're going to have abundance. You're going to have eternal life. But whoever's sits around and doesn't do anything and doesn't believe what God's saying, doesn't believe what um, Christ has done for us, well, that is going to be taken away from him because he's going to hell. I mean, Jesus says the only way to, the, to heaven is through him. And, and so what if I told you that, Lauren, today? If I told you, if you don't believe me, then you are going to burn in hell for all eternity. I have no nothing to say that. I mean, I know, I believe what the Bible says. I believe that it is Okay, so Lauren, do you think you I would be a good person? You have, her, if, you have to believe in this invisible tree that's out in my front yard. If you don't believe in that invisible tree, you're going to burn. And and is would a good God, would a good God even threaten eternal torture if if you don't believe something? Like okay. this is not even a good God that so, would do that. So, the answer is no. You listen, don't threaten. God is good. God is good. Then why does he threaten to torture you in I, hellfire? Because he gave us, I, I heard you talking something about else about the Which garden God? of Eden. Because there's listen, multiple of them. The God, the one true Jehovah God, um, he in the, the garden of Eden, Abraham when he created, God. when he created earth, he created the Garden of Eden. Yes, it was perfect. Everything was just right. He did put one tree in there. He gave, he told Adam and Eve to, they had one rule, basically. And he gave this them that rule allegory, because Lauren, they had free will. Story. He wanted them to have free will. Do you want to make somebody <laughs> love you? Does somebody love you if they if you make <laughs> Lauren, Lauren, so listen, listen story. for a second. Listen, hold, hold up. So Jeff, if you got the best examples of this. So if I wanted you to, ha if, if I told my children, I want you guys to just live your own life. I want you to uh, decide your own fate. I want, I want to give you the freedom. But if you mess up, if you do what I don't want you to do, I'm going to throw you in a fire. This is a terrorist uh, uh, tactic. This is not something that a loving God would do. Say, I'm just going to let you, if you play, I'm just going to let you go wherever you want to go. If you play in the street, who cares? If you get squashed by a car, that's your fault. It's not my fault. You get free will, go wherever you want, do whatever you want. 
And if you get squashed by a car, don't blame me. That's but but I want to. Well, so so I want to talk about Matthew chapter twenty five because you brought this up, Lauren. You brought up the parable where he gives you know one guy ten talents, one guy five, and one guy two or whatever. So that's in Matthew chapter twenty five, or at least one of the occasions is in Matthew twenty five. And so in in verse. Uh, 24, Matthew 25, 24. It says, Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, and Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I do not sow, and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus admits that he is a harsh slave owner who expects you to provide more to him than he gives you. You're supposed to do something to, that he can't do for himself. You're a slave who has to profit for an evil slave owner and if you don't do good enough, you get tortured in, in return. This is not what a good God would do. This is what an evil Roman empire would do and say, you need to pay your taxes. You need to, you, you need to forsake everything in your life and you need to glorify me and me only because again, all that matters in this life is that I get glorified. Once again, this is a parable and it is a metaphor. It's not. A metaphor for an evil God who Just tortures listen. people who don't do enough parable, for him. It's for this one is talking about Christ's return. There are going to be two people, two kinds of people. There are going to be people working towards furthering the kingdom, letting others know about Christ's second return. And Je we already said person. Jesus said he was going to return before they died and that they when they saw the signs, they needed to flee Judea to the mountains. This is not for us, Lauren. It was not written for you. It's 2,000 years old, written in a different language that Jesus didn't even speak. Jesus did not speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic. So every word that's in this New Testament had to be translated to something that Jesus wouldn't have even said. This is a Greek religion. It is contradictory to the Hebrew religion. It is not uh, the natural progression for, of Judaism. It is... It was written by the enemies of the Jews and that Jesus is representing the Roman Empire. This is why he's saying, pay your taxes, worship me. All he's saying, follow You need rules. to be poor. He's saying, follow people. Like you have to give to Caesar what's Caesar's because, I mean, that because, is... Because there was a rebellion uh, in the first century where the Jews were not paying their taxes. So... The Romans created a Jewish Messiah that says, no, 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 you do need to pay your taxes. Uh, Correct. I will pray for y'all souls. I just. Okay, I, Lauren. Okay, and, Lauren. And, and, uh, so, so if you pray for our souls and if we burn in hell, that means your God did not answer your prayer. Correct? No, that means that I can pray for you, but that doesn't mean that you're going to change because there goes that, th that free will, oh, that free okay. will to believe what God. So what is it that you want to pray for? What is it that you're going to ask God for on our behalf? What do you specifically? To change your heart. Okay. But he can't change my heart because of free will. That's impossible. Why would you ask him to override my free will? He can't do that. It's impossible. Ooh, because he's, well, then you're, good, I mean, Jeff. He does have places in the Bible where he hardens people people's hearts. He hardened Pharaoh's okay, hearts. Okay, then he then free will followers. is not a thing. Then free will doesn't exist. Free will. <laughs> once you break that rule, once it, it destroys the whole contract. 
So free will is not taught anywhere in the Bible, Lauren. Free will is a man-made concept that is not even taught in the Bible. There is no verse anywhere in the Bible that says God has given man free will. It doesn't exist because the Bible says on every single page that God is sovereign over the lives and the minds and the hearts of men. God does whatever he wants in the lives of men. So he can't, so the Bible says that he can change your heart. So if you pray that he changes my heart, the Bible says that he can. He can. So that means free will is a false doctrine and that you could pray for him to change my heart. But if you pray that he changes my heart and if my heart does not change, that means that your God is fake. No, it doesn't. And not all of my prayers are answered. No, it, it does. It says if you believe in me, then your prayers will be answered. And it does and answer, of Matthew. Wait, right. it doesn't say answered. It never says answered. It says ask and it will be given. That's what it says. Because people want to change it around and say, oh, no is an answer. It never says that I might say no. It says that if you believe, then you will receive. If you pray and you believe, then you will receive. So if you pray and believe, but you don't receive, that means this Bible is unreliable and that your God is unreliable. You see, I prayed a million times to this God. He demonstrated to me that he is unreliable. He does not keep his promises. He has no power at all. And I know who wrote this book. And it was not holy divine men sent from God. It was evil men sent by the Roman Empire. And so, and the reason I want you to change, Lauren, is because I know with absolute certainty that you are brainwashed. You believe lies and you're wasting your life on a God that does not exist. Okay, so what happens after death? Nothing. You die, you stay dead, you have no consciousness whatsoever. This okay. life is all you get. But what if that's not true? If it's not true, if you're right? then there's no way we could know about it anyway. And if God is evil, if he wants to torture people, then you're, you're just as likely to be tortured as me. And, and have, any God, any God that would torture me, uh, is unworthy of praise. In fact, I would say any God who tortures you or any other human on earth, I don't even care if it's Ted Bundy. If God tortures Ted Bundy, uh, now Ted Bundy probably deserves a little bit of torture because he tortured many other people. Oh, uh, but I would say that a good God would actually have prevented Ted Bundy from torturing all those people that he that he did. That's what a good God would have done. Just prevent it. I mean, he could have snuffed him out or he could have, you know, whatever. God could have prevented it, but he didn't. And so I would say the one that really needs to be uh, punished is God because God allowed the evil to happen and he could have stopped it, but didn't. How do you... Um, so you don't believe in the devil or demons or anything? Like Correct. That? Correct. Nothing. I do not believe in those guys. Okay. You don't. <laughs> I just have. The reason why I don't even believe Lauren is because the Bible attaches the scriptures to people's hopes. If she gives up on this belief, she feels like she's given up hope. And this is exactly how it's designed. So you stay in the religion. Hope is there, though, to encourage. And I'm not staying in a religion because, yes, that's what I grew up in. But I talk to God and he speaks to me, not audibly, but he speaks to my heart and my mind. I know and he's telling mind. me things when he tells me things. You're hearing your mind. I know what that is right there. And that's your conscious. Talking to you and your subconscious. How did consciousness I is no. it's, consciousness is where they get the concept of God. Subconsciousness is God the Almighty, and your consciousness state is Jesus, trying to connect you from your subconscious to your conscious. That's the that's where they get Jesus well, and God from. All right, hold on, that's getting a little deep. Let me let me say something. Uh, Lauren, I believed in God for forty six years. 
I actually thought he was there. I thought I was praying to the God of the universe who created all things. And I went through a mental breakdown when I was becoming an atheist. It, it was, it was hard on me. Uh, you know, I, I said, Oh my goodness, I, I've sacrificed all my life so that I can please God and go to heaven. Uh, and now I don't even believe this place is real. It was extremely upsetting. So, so if you ever take that journey, uh, there are me and a whole bunch of other people that will support you in that process because it is a hard process to go through. I've I've pretty much gone all the way through it now. I'm I'm fine with. Uh, I mean, I I still can't answer the question, what what's the origin of life, and that bothers me a little bit. But but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I can provide the evidence to back it up that. Uh, this religion is is completely unreliable. Christianity and everything about the Bible. So Judaism too, and and Islam is even based on it too. So throw that one in too. But uh, so so my question to you, Lauren, is, and I'll I'll go on to other people after this. Oh, uh, if it's not true, if Christianity is not true. Would you still choose to believe the lie or would you rather know the truth? Would you rather live your life being honest with the evidence or would you rather just blindly believe in something that has evidence that it is false? I believe in the Bible and I believe in Jesus and that's who I'm going to believe in. I believe I know, I feel, I have had peace, and okay. I don't question But you, did, you didn't answer my question. So I think you did answer my question indirectly. So I want you to think for a second. Just see if you can even process the possibility that Christianity is not a true religion, that the Bible is not from God. Can you even process the possibility that men wrote the Bible and that they were not inspired by God to tell the truth or... Uh, to tell about secret things in the spiritual realm, that it's just a comic book. Can you even process that thought? No, I no, right. I can't because I mean I could. I see what you're saying that yes, it was written by men. The whole book, the Bible, was written by a physical man, a different one at different times. But I still believe the words that are in it and what they say, and I believe so, there's a hell that I do not want to be in for eternal life. And, and, this life is fleeting and it's going to be gone before I know it. And well, I just know that I have hell. faith. Do you what? Need to study hell. Study hell? Yeah. I really don't care to study hell because I'm not going there. Well, I'm just saying if you study it, you see it's not even what do you, you think it is. Do you think I'm going there, Lauren? I do. I'm sorry, but I do. Does that bother you? Jeff, Jeff, I really commend me. you. That's why I really I'm commend you, Jeff. Well, hold she up, Ackley. She don't even care to study it to see if it's real. It don't bother her. Well, hold up, y'all. So, Lauren, does it bother you that, that your God is going to torture me for all eternity? That's not how I see it. I see it as you rejecting God. Okay. So, do you have children, Lauren? Yes, I've already so told she you has that. Comfortability. Would you torture any of your children if they didn't please you? No. I Why wouldn't. do you think your God yeah. would? Because it's the choice that you make. What if I your children is, chose to, to leave human. you? What if you're, Lauren, I, what, I, I know, and you are a better human being than God is because you would never, ever torture your children, even if they rejected you to your face and said, Mom, I, I hate you and I don't ever want to have anything to do with you the rest of my life. You would still love them, and you would never want them to suffer at all. Exactly. But yet, you believe in a God that says, "Just because." Listen, I'm not. I'm not telling God that I know you're real, and I just choose not to worship you. I'm saying I don't believe that God wrote this book, that men wrote this book, and that they are dishonest, and that they are saying things that are not true. I'm saying that men are liars. I'm not saying that I hate God. I'm saying that. God did not write this book. 
but how can you i mean you don't even believe that he exists anymore like you were because never he doesn't show me any evidence that he exists he don't talk to me like he like you say he talks to you but even though you don't hear it you just have this feeling in your heart you see i can have a feeling in my heart too and i did for for many years i thought that i was really talking to god but now i realize that i was just talking to myself she has a personal relationship supposedly with the lord this way it's irrefutable whatever arguments come towards her right it is i mean i have faith and i do believe and he also says blessed are the ones that believe and don't see more than the ones that were there with him and and, and why do you think somebody would want you to believe in something that you have no evidence for why would they why why don't god just come and show us something today if he does if he every day no he does well, not lauren the, the air does, the wind no lauren jesus didn't lauren jesus what? didn't say jesus did not come and say look at the wind look at the trees look at the squirrels this is the evidence for god jesus came and healed people of their sicknesses cast out demons raised people from the dead why does god not do that today he does do that oh my goodness I okay do lauren there are demons i do believe God. there are demons i believe You're, so so lauren i i enjoyed our conversation on the one hand on the other hand uh i'm so sad to see that you are so brainwashed that you cannot uh cannot make a rational statement she doesn't want truth yeah you don't want the truth you, you make excuses you. for lies i know the truth and i will no, you don't. I commend you jeff Okay. You worship a God that's going to torture me for all eternity. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, because you reject him. You, Lauren, I'm not rejecting I, him. I'm really? rejecting men that wrote the book. I'm saying that God did not write this book. And and if God, because I have a thousand uh, data points that proves that this book is evil, that it's that it's saying that women are only exist for the pleasure of men and that you need to keep your mouth shut, you need to cover your head, and you can't wear nice clothes and jewelry, but yet, I'm, and that it's okay to beat your slaves and be harsh to your slaves, but yet you make excuses for all this evil and you just say it's okay to worship a God who is going to torture millions of people in fire for all eternity. It's amazing that you can even let the word love come out of your mouth that you can even have children and and say that you love your children and and in, and then believe that god is love no lo no person who loves people will ever torture them in fire it doesn't require an intelligent person to understand that torturing in fire is not love Lauren, and I so think i will not worship a god who threatens to torture people in fire because i am smarter than that i'm not so and easily duped you, into worshiping an evil god who tortures this people you, this is you leaning on your own understanding Lord, here Lord, and thinking and it's all about you Lord, get the get the app bible hub or go to bible hub and look up the word gehenna you'll see that that word gehenna replaces every word hell that you have in the new testament All right, Kofi, what's up? What's All right, up, man? another thing. You cannot throw oh, a you. spirit inside a fire, first of all. Spirits don't have nerve endings. That's only exactly. something characterized by the body. So it's exactly. not like when you pass away, it's going to put you back in your body and burn you. That That's why how, that's how you know that's a lie. And gnashing of teeth, your spirit or energy does not have teeth. So that that's right there... Would just for the people that not even thinking that would fear them. There is no and nerve endings and teeth on it, spirits or energy vessels. Dominant. <laughs> How about you, Jeff? Like, like that guy. That's the big clue right there that the Bible has no idea what it's talking about. 